So a very warm welcome to what is the 133rd Security Thought Leadership Webinar. And uh, the idea of these webinars, Thought Leadership, is to critique today in order that we get a better type of security tomorrow. So we're not trying to solve the world's problems today. Just understand some issues. Think about where it's going. What are the barriers to progress and how might they be overcome? And the topic today is one that's emerged in different ways in previous webinars. It's what is meant by profit protection. And is anyone really doing it? And uh, of course, the uh, ways in which this has cropped up previously is that people are saying, can we learn from the retail sector and its focus on protecting profits because that's the holy grail of business. Do that well and um, you've got the route to, well, the riches. Um, um, but there's a question mark about the extent to which that's happening, the way that it's happening and where it's really going. And I'm very grateful to Lodge Service for chipping in with uh, this suggestion uh, um, and indeed for inspire us to think about a topic which we should have visited many times ago specifically, delighted to be doing it now. And we will be doing more on this going forward. Um, so let me just get rid of that. That, that is never... Well, it's 133. That's never happened. It's no longer used and we go and get a phone ring. OK, what I'm going to do, I'm going to get um, um, the three uh, panellists to introduce themselves from Australia and two from the UK. Once they've done that, I will invite them to make their opening statement, their chance to say whatever they want to say about that subject matter. And when we've done that, we'll come to you, the audience, to ask questions. Please use the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. So without further ado, then, let's meet our panellists. And first of all, let's go to London and meet Sarah. Sarah, can you introduce yourself, please? Hi, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining today's Thought Leadership. Um, Sarah Cork, I'm currently the Group Commercial Director at Lodge Service. I've spent many years in an array of different businesses across retail, omnichannel, logistics, supply chain, e-commerce, merchants and supermarketing before moving to the supplier side with the um, last 18 months at Interserve and now with the Lodge Service Group. Thank you. Sarah, thank you very much indeed. And you're very welcome. Let's go up to Leicester and just back from holiday last night. Doesn't stop him being here. Paul, please introduce yourself. Thank, thank, thank you, Martin. So um, uh, Paul Bessant, uh, founder of Retail Knowledge, which uh, most people might know uh, for running the Retail Risk Conference series around the world. We're entering our 20th year doing that. Um, prior to Retail Knowledge, I was a, a raft of retailers starting off at Homebase, the DIY retailer, when it was owned by Sainsbury's, went through a couple of cooperative societies and then joined German discounter Aldi. Uh, when uh, it only got 25 stores in the UK. It's a very, very small, completely run out of Germany at the time. I've done uh, a couple of stints with e-commerce associations before and after the dot-com boom, and even spent two years on secondment at the European Commission, which in itself is a 45-minute webinar on, uh, on the curiosities of that. But thank you for the invite. Pleased to be here. Thanks very much indeed, Paul. Yeah, we, I don't think we'll be doing the European Commission. I'm not sure it'll be very inspiring. Uh, um, and uh, many of you will know that Colin Cullington was due to be here. He's unfortunately been called away. He's got a family illness. But we're very grateful to Scott Taylor chipping in all the way from Sydney, where they're in lockdown. It doesn't stop. Scott Taylor, join us. Scott, please introduce yourself. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Scott Taylor. I've uh, been in security, safety and risk industry for 28 years. I'm the chief operating officer with Southern Cross Group and the regional vice president for ACES International for Region 15B. So really happy to be here with you guys today. Thank you very much indeed. Now, those of you who joined Break It In, I know that's uh, that's all of you, will know that what we do is now we invite our panelists to make an opening statement. Three minutes for them to say whatever they want to say about the subject matter. So uh, don't forget, if you'd like to ask a question, get your question in early and we'll endeavour to incorporate it in the discussion that follows. Use the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. So let's go back to Sarah and Sarah, your opening statement, please. Thank you. Um, so what I really wanted you to do is really think today about what is your profit protection mission? What does this impact mean to you as a business and what is it that you're trying to deliver? I've spent many years about trying to carve out what this actually looks like. And so I've got some words here for you today just to give you some thought provoking what this looks like back in your business. So is it about collaborating in partnership to maximize profitability whilst reducing risk in a safe and secure environment? And that will take you away to just think about what that really means within your business model. 
And then just moving on about profit protection objectives. So what is your objective? How are you starting to address it? And what does this mean to you? Mm -hmm. So the objectives I've written down for profit protection was to drive and develop a positive culture in deterring crime whilst maximizing company profitability. So that to me, you know, is the strap line for profit protection and what we're trying to achieve. But then just to pull down from that is we're maximizing our capability to grow profitability within the business while driving a sales growth. So we're all here to support the business to be able to drive sales, but what we need to do is maximize that profitability as well. And then to provide a safe and secure environment for employees, suppliers, visitors to your business. So those are the three objectives that really, for me, mean what profit protection is. And then if I move on to, you know, understanding your business and what is thought provoking for you, how are you securing it? So what is it you want to secure? And, you know, there's four things that come to mind for me. It's about your premises, your assets, your data and your people. And then some of the challenges that you come from from there is, you know, what are your challenges and risks and how do you how do you address the risk and what are your mitigations? How do you measure your ROI? What does that really look for like for you? How do you become a self-funding department within a business that's driving profitability? And what does it cost you to secure? So what does it actually cost you to deliver profit protection within your business models? And what is it the cost not to secure? Which is a really good question that most of us get asked most days of the week. And so if I look at the risks and challenges that I see within profit protection, you know, the first one on my list would be business continuity. So, you know, we've just come through the pandemic and I think the first thing for me when, you know, we were going into a pandemic was the business continuity plan. And I'd spent many years avoiding that Bible in the background thinking, you know, it was just something that was always there that we, you know, we would need one day, but I'd never actually relied on it. This was for me was about pulling that out and realizing we had a bird flu um, business continuity plan that there we could adapt and move that through for, through for COVID and for the pandemic. But for the first time ever, that was something that I really relied on as my Bible. Some of the other challenges are legal irregularity, trading, people, customer experience, supply chain and Brexit. So Brexit's been a real one for us this year. But then VAT and tax, technology and financial crime. So through the, you know, the last 18 months, we've all probably removed cash and gone to card, but actually there's a massive financial crime piece coming underneath that. And it's how do we protect this versus the organized crime gangs? So those are some of the things that I would like to think about today and just you know, really go back to your businesses and think about. If I looked at the challenges from business continuity, it's about who's the owner and who's responsible for it. So again, you know, when you pull out a business continuity plan and you're part of a wider business, actually, does it have the need and fit for you from a profit protection perspective? And are you partly owner of that? Do you have a robust plan? Do you have a communication strategy? And, you know, how do you look at that challenge from a Brexit perspective? And then how do you measure those risks? And today, throughout today, if you want to ask any further questions on those, happy to drop down in a few more of those subjects. And back over to you, Martin. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. OK, don't forget to, um, your chance to ask questions using the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. Let's go to Paul then. And Paul, uh, let's get your thoughts on this. You know a bit about this as well. Paul Besson. Um, so I think, you know, Sarah asks all of the right questions there and the bit I would throw in is having been I'm afraid to say involved in retail for 35 years the last 20 or so in risk and loss prevention it's too often if we take the mindset I think you know too often profit protection certainly by other retail colleagues is seen as sales prevention and this mindset that if you take high value items off the shop floor nobody can steal them zero shrinkage right you know profit protection teams are often seen as the as the as the no guys the no girls who turn up sit outside of the function of creating a great retail experience uh, and in many instances are just the worst you know exponents of, of stopping retail driving forward so all of those questions that sarah asked i think are absolutely valid but there's a way in which um things can be approached and you know often and not to devalue X law enforcement that might make their way into profit protection and risk, but you still hear people talking about, oh, I can spot a bad one at 10 paces. And they still have this 
um, idea that it's, it's all about stopping things. And yes, it is about stopping things. But for me, great examples of loss prevention, of profit protection, are people that view retail first, sales first, the great customer experience first, and then look at the processes and minimize risk. Retail is, after all, a risky business. It's like opening the front door of your house, letting complete strangers walk in, and then sitting at the bottom of your garden, hoping that people come down and pay for what they browse. It's a risky business. We have to accept that. And so taking that approach to profit protection and saying retail is risky, we have to look at the processes and we have to have the right mindset to increase sales, for me, is the angle to go forward. And, and one thing just to add on that before we come back to you, Martin, is that you know, in my personal experience, any retailer that does not acknowledge that internal theft is a top three risk, if not the biggest risk in their business, is quite frankly deluding themselves. And so looking at processes and looking at culture on whether our staff uh, and partners and providers all feel empowered and vested in the business for me is the first place to to start then we can worry about whether we stop billy baseball cap running out of the store with it used to be a handful of vcrs then it was dvds then it was jackets, whatever the current item is so my my take on this and i see this all around the world is that there are still retail businesses that have a no culture to profit protection and they almost sit outside of the retail experience. And the best ones and those that drive forward are those where the profit protection team are invited to the top table. They're invited to contribute on store layout. They're invited to contribute even on property locations. And, and that for me is really how you should be doing everything that Sarah lists as the to-do list. So there's my opening, opening gambit there. So over to you, Martin. Thanks, Paul. Some good stuff for thought leadership there. And we'll come back on some of those issues in a minute. So let's out without further ado, let's go over to Sydney then. And Scott, your statement, please. Uh, mentally, if I had the list of a few other points I'd run through, I was actually watching them get ticked off by Sarah and uh, like and Paul. So I suppose where, where I would probably would add to add some additional content would be, you know, there was we touched a little bit on the internal and, and external theft and some other parts as well. But I think part of true profit protection is looking at the, the other elements. So the intercompany fraud, how we're managing suppliers, making sure the people we have are trusted and vetted as well. And I think, I think that part and taking the true supply chain security risk management approach and looking at the various nodes we have in that is a really, really crucial part um, for making sure we tie in as well. And, and sadly, I think it's one um, that's often overlooked. So I think as we've got the current, you know, the evolving landscape we got and, I completely agree with what Paul um, you know, said earlier as well. There's improvements that occur in different parts of you know, store layout and, and other elements as well. But And part of it is finding the right balance between the operational efficiencies and what's not going to detract from, um, from sales as well. What's going to maintain the customer experience, but at the same time be helping to, you know, to, to control and improve the position we're in. And I think it's just a matter of having some more holistic planning review what not what are all the profit generators but what are also the other parts when it comes to profit protection process failure shipping costs labor costs all those sort of things as well so i, I think um having a a more detailed and probably some of the not generic um points to focus on i think is really important to round this off thanks very much indeed scott okay well you know let me let me come back to you perhaps paul i can start with you because i think um i enjoyed your comments paul but i wonder whether uh, um, but what we're really saying here, with me saying it, is, look, the truth of the matter is the world of loss prevention or profit protection simply hasn't got the skill sets to do this well. It lacks clout because it's not business focused. The people in it are not coming from a business background. That's why it's marginal. That's why it can't speak at the high table. And that's why it's not quite obviously speaking the language of business. Ooh, they're just not up to it, Paul. Your thoughts? Um, that is a completely true and a completely false statement on, on, on both counts. You are absolutely right. There are some 
profit protection teams that I think are, use the word, you know, legacy, historic. They have the worst elements of, um, I'm sorry to say it, but the worst elements of law enforcement in them. Um, and they are not invited to the top table. They don't understand retail and they don't contribute to the business. And yet flip across, so there's some amazing uh, you know, profit protection teams in retail who are putting themselves forward to take on everything from you know, lighting in the car parks to the number plate recognition of uh, you know, people entering the, the retail park. They are being invited to, to work with distribution centers on the, on the picking order and the layout in warehouses. And that's because they're retailers first that understand profit protection as part of that business. But what amazes me is I can think back to my very first conference that I put on at Chelsea Football Club in 2002, before Abramovich took over with all of his money. They actually wanted the cash then, so they were happy to rent the West Stand to us. And we were sat there talking about exactly this subject. People were still in denial that internal theft was a major problem. They were still in denial about where profit protection should sit within the business. And they were in denial about if they would ever be invited to the top table. Now we have seen a shift, but 20 years, come on guys and girls, that's taken too long really. And it's the same the world over. It's not, you know, not just a, a UK, European problem. In my personal opinion, one of if not the biggest retail market in the world has actually gone backward in the last five or six years compared to it taking a different tack to to maybe the rest of the world so you're absolutely right but but you're equally equally um terribly wrong with that statement martin okay fair enough well, let me come to you scott uh, um if i might because uh, you you said you were in agreement with the general statement here scott it seems to me given what paul said is that in many many cases we've got the wrong people running the show here uh, retailer first, um, loss prevention second. Forget your loss prevention training. It's just about being a business person, Scott. Yeah. And, and I think part of it is about having all the right combination of teams because we have we're, it's a, the person running it, but if they're not getting the information from the various uh, teams and different stakeholders within the business, then frankly, they're just missing a large portion of the content. And the reason I touched before on about, aside from the internal and external theft and others, a lot of organizations are like just unfortunately unaware of the the impact that they can have with their logistics partners, their third party suppliers and others, whether that be security code of conduct, terms of conditions. I, I don't know, we look at transference of risk through insurance and contract and others, but that doesn't transfer reputational risk and for other parts. So I think um, having that that focal point here like it is important. But if we're not having multiple team member representation you know, at the table when we're doing this planning then we're, we're doomed to fail. So it just needs to be more broader and more effective, right? Like I, I think, to get this correct. Okay, thank you. And I've said, I purposely came to you third here because um, it just struck me. I wonder whether you agree with this. And uh, um, because it strikes me there's an enormous opportunity here, um, if that's the case, for businesses that are focused on, um, on this... Uh, on this gap, on this uh, weakness, on this endemic uh, um, need for a, a, a bit of uh, business now, so retailer first, as Paul put it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think where I see profit protection done really, really well, it's about that function being embedded within a business. And it's about each key stakeholder being brought into the profit protection. And ultimately, this starts with your strategy. And it's about, you know, defining your strategy, getting everybody bought in and on the same journey as you but then realising the benefits that come with that. So actually, you know, what is your mitigation? How are you mitigating it? Is that policy? Is it procedure? Is it your business continuity plans? And it's having that robust framework that you can then leverage and build on to, to be able to move forward. But yeah, so I've seen it done really, really poorly. And that's where business, you know, the team are not embedded within the business and they're struggling to prove an ROI. Um, and, you know, they've seen it the other side where it's about strategy, it's design, it's approach, it's about key stakeholders. It's about having a part of every single policy and procedure within a business that has a profit protection look and feel that goes with it. Yeah, OK. And But I wonder, I wonder, Sarah. So um, uh, have a strategy you start with. OK, that sounds to me eminently sensible to what how what percentage 
of retail profit protection departments have a meaningful strategy for tackling profit, a good one, uh, within the, the which is backed by the hierarchy? What percentage would you would you say? I think it's very low, um, and I'd be, I'm going to say it's about five percent. So my oh. years, yeah, and my years of being client side, um, it is very difficult. So you can write it, but it's about being that embedded. So it's about then getting your key hill stakeholders to sign it off. And there's always a reason why they don't want to sit in the room and have that conversation with you. But, you know, you're on that sales pitch to try and get them on board. And I think it is really low. And I think the other thing, Martin, that's really key to talk about is, you know, you have a strategy, but it's something that needs revisiting every year. So there should be a tactical plan and an action plan that comes from that. And I think that's the piece that then probably doesn't get followed through. And that should be your agenda point every single month on the board report. You know, actually, what was our tactical plan? What's our action plan in delivering this? OK, fair enough. Now, let's go to some questions then, because they're flooding in. Scott, I'm going to come to you first on this. Uh, um, and uh, uh, William Deal asked the question. We've got two questions, actually. But um, um, Scott, his question is, would speakers agree that we need to look at ourselves, ourselves first to get security, loss prevention, theft, risks, etc., to be included in the overall business register? I mean, isn't it a damning indictment on the state of this world that that is not a given? Uh, Scott, do you do you also agree it's five percent? I doing it properly, I'd probably say that or, or lower. Um, and yeah, I, I completely agree that, that there needs to be the, like your first that that self review. Uh, I mean, the ideal for me when I start having discussions in this space and we start talking about you know the the environment, septed principles. What are we going to be doing for you know, layout, lighting, and other parts for manipulating things there? Then the other basics of great customer services along with great security because people with good intention want to be noticed people with bad intention don't so let's work on your service programs and tying these things together uh, organizations are quite siloed with what they do and because they're not getting that either looking externally for specialists to support and not getting internal multiple team representation that's where there's a lot of these gaps and and sadly I suppose talking from the security industry point of view with being one of the few industries where your performance is rated by how often things don't happen um, my opening discussion with a lot of the clients we deal with is that resilience needs to be a, 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 on everybody's job description and everybody's got to have a role to play with this. So that's why we need to be um, so thorough with the planning and getting that correct. So I wholeheartedly agree there needs to be a very cold, um, you know, cold hard look internally first at, at all elements to get to get the right response. So completely agree. OK, uh, Paul, would you put it at five percent? And uh, um, to answer this, does the sector need to take a look at itself first, as William Deal suggests, Paul? The um, the only thing that offers me um, that, that, that gives me confidence and, 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 and buoyancy, if you like, is and I think the five percent figure is that are doing it exceptionally well is probably about right. However, I would say there's probably about a third of retailers who are aspiring to be in that 5%. They know that they're on a journey, they're aware of the benefits, and they're all aware that if they make themselves more, you know, indisposable to the board, there'll be more resources, they'll be leaned on more, you know, they'll, they'll have greater fulfillment, if you like. So it is quite low, but there's a lot of awareness out there um, and a growing awareness, I like to think, that actually this is a journey worth going on and then interestingly over the last few years there's a few retailers that are doing exceptional things that are coming forward and they're happy to share those with other retailers it's moved outside of the the retail competitive bits and you know within the uk and i'll name check a couple here but you look at the likes of jd sports and they're doing it globally or next or boots they're on the front foot and they will have conversations with other retailers and share the great stuff that they're doing and I think that overall has the ben has the potential to drive the industry forward as well so it's that kind of stuff that, that I get excited about when I when I see that and people sharing what's going on yeah okay thanks very much Steve. well let's uh, let's move on I mean uh, um, there are quite a few questions coming around this let me come back to you Sarah now I've got a question from Adrian Beck Professor Adrian Beck who perhaps more than anyone in the world has uh, um, um, tried to inspire thinking about this uh, this topic matter with his research. And uh, his, his uh, for me, quite damning question says, um, isn't the real problem that we've never agreed what shrink it is and what actual retail loss mean? 
they're the fundamentals and there's not even an agreement on those sarah yeah and i think adrian hello um your total loss piece about the 333 buckets of loss is absolutely key and it's still one of the things that sticks with me today um because actually does a business really understand what those lost parts are and then if you if you're not understanding what those lost parts are how are you driving change how are you making that different for your business? How are you going back with your RI? But not only that, how do you measure all of these things? So if you've not identified it to start with, you know, what are you going back to your board with? So, you know, I quite often hear no noise is good noise. So if we're never reporting anything in, we think we've never got any losses because we're not actually getting under the car bonnet. You know, if we don't get a fine, we take that as being great because we think that we're, you know, we're, we're uncovered. Um, you know, the theft and fraud cases, if we're not reporting high volumes, again, it's one of the things that we, you know, it's a measure that if we're not reporting it in, everyone thinks it's not a problem. So Adrian, no, I absolutely agree. It's how do you identify that loss to start with within your business model? And then what's your output after that? Uh, um, just come back to you this on Scott. I mean, uh, Scott, it does feel rather damning, I have to say, as a, 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 if I stand back in thought leadership terms, that we're still trying to work out the fundamentals here about what we mean by loss and what we mean by shrinkage. Now, I mean, I don't want to overstate this, but it does feel a bit like, uh, um, goodness me, how have we got to this stage and uh, all these years and we're still still trying to deal with that? Am I right to feel that, Scott, or am I overstating it? Yes, no, no, I, I definitely feel you're, you're right in saying that. I, I mean, there's you know, multiple de you know, definitions and obviously most you know, current recent ones like you're being sales income that's not you know, not going to be realized and like your know, revenue from products that have been purchased and I, I mean, there's multiple, yeah, multiple definitions uh, like a year for it. And I agree, getting getting that clarity and that unified, um, you know, the unified uh, you know, definition of it, I, I could think is important. Um, and I, I know I'm sort of half on a bit, but I, but I truly think, you know, one of the, the largest gaps and from, you know, I can say nationally and, and, and globally from the organization that I deal with as well is, is that holistic look like, like at things. And then, you know, from the delivery plain paper packaging and routes, you know, we're talking security about protecting all assets, people, property, information, and reputation, yet information delivery routes, plain paper packaging, all these sort of things that should be like involved and focused on as well just aren't really like on a lot of organizations radars and it's because they're not as i said getting that multi-team representation I, I see that as being the biggest fundamental gap and sometimes when they do obviously get some team members together then you've got the pride and ego issue to deal with because they've now got 20 new things on their radar that because of their experience and skill set weren't there so how you manage that like like like, like in managing change for that process as well so i think it folds into a lot yeah, I mean, I, I was just about to pick you up on that, actually, and then you start slightly answered your question. I mean, I get your point about multi uh, 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 multi skill teams, but of course, mm -hmm. that's not a. Um, you, in theory, it sounds great, and of course, but in practice, to make that work meaningfully, it's a bit of a challenge, isn't it? Yeah, def definitely. I, I think because realistically, you know, from that perspective, I, I actually smiled when Sarah said before and about the business continuity plans. You know, of you know how many organisations over the last eighteen months have had to take that shiny folder off. Um, blow the dust on it and look and say, let's look at our IT point of view. Oh, I change your password every 30 days. Is there a page two? Um, let alone all these other, all these other parts. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of good that's going to come out of this um, because it's forcing organizations to look, even though there's a fair bit of whale watching happening. This has occurred now. Let's rush and look into, the, into this side of the boat and make these changes. Um, this is now occurring like different parts. So I think that, uh, you know, having that good balanced and strategic approach is going to be important. And I think getting some information out to the organizations, like getting more sharing some information on the easy structure and how that can work for those multi-teams, I think is really, really important because whether it's pride, ego, lack of skill, knowledge, lack of awareness, lack of awareness of um, even with some of their external partners, what they can really develop out of those relationships as well for these sort of things. There's, there's a lot of gray areas there. And I think, um, combined, I'm going to say combined industry until we really uh, are more transparent with that, we're going to be slow to develop. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, and Paul, let me come back to you. And Richard Webb has got a couple of questions. And I want to see if I can put both to you if I can. I mean, Paul, obviously, you, 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 you in your opening, uh, in, in your opening introduction, made the point that you're involved with uh, uh, conferences around the world. Um, and I suppose the first thing is, Paul, is there is there a regional difference here? And and, and more to the point. 
Is there an area or example of good practice that you could point to where you would say that is that's definitely the place to go? The second point is uh, also picking up on something you said in your opening statement is the tendency to fall, um, have ex law enforcement in retail roles. We've actually done a webinar on this in the past. And uh, um, some some damning questions I've got to come in from people saying it was the wrong way to go. They're not business orientated, etc. Um, but I wonder whether I can ask you about um, is there a shift away from this law enforcement or is that still the dominant theme? So two questions, Paul. Example of good practice. Is there a place in the world? Secondly, what about this form of law enforcement? What's the trends? Then I'll come to Sarah on the same question. Paul. Um, example of uh, good practice, then. Um, I would actually have to say um, the UK and UK retailers are there or thereabouts, believe it or not, um, in terms of good practice. And um, my personal opinion, if you start from the UK and you sort of go through Europe, the Middle East, Asia, down to Australia, there, there's a sharing of information you see moving up and down. There are some cultural differences and, you know, questioning a superior in certain parts of the world is a is a no-no and so there's perhaps not such great openness there but i think i think the uk for me stands out um there's some great retail examples in in particularly western europe i have to say when you get to the middle east and asia it dries up a little bit because of cultural differences and then not necessarily and, and then you know not just because scott's on the on the on the webinar, but Australia's got some great examples as well. Um, and, and I know it's UK, but I think it was glue. Now, JD, I think there's some great stuff in Australia. I think the Cotton On Group have got some good examples. Woolworths, um, there's a few more. They're, they're really open to driving the business forward. My personal opinion is that um, the US has gone down a different path, very much focused on organized retail crime and violence in stores, and that doesn't necessarily translate to, to what's happening in the, in the rest of the world. Um, and so that would sort of a, be a shout out. And in terms of law enforcement, you can't, I use that slightly provocatively, there are some superb ex-law enforcement individuals within retail, but overall, if you were to take a traditional law enforcement individual who's you know, you would arguably say very stereotypical straight out of a 1970s or 1980s cop show off the TV, they're still being hired today. And, and, and I do question that. Conversely, you've got some people that have been involved in counterintelligence, managing national sports teams, celebrities, and they can bring a whole raft of expertise to certain retailers that they need. Uh, and, and absolutely, I get why they're Hired. So my my comment about law enforcement is really just a, a sort of checksum, if you like, on on the raft of expertise that, that they've got. OK, so very briefly, if I could ask you, sir, I want to get some more questions in uh, yeah. just specifically this point about law enforcement. It does sound counterintuitive that if you're going to argue you need a business like approach, which all three of you have done, that you would mm -hmm. then really try and pick on a group who clearly have got skill sets, but they're distinctly not business like. So, so my response to that would be there has to be a balance. So I, I've seen some excellent law enforcement joining our businesses and being able to work through. And I think it depends what role you're employing them for. So if it's an investigatory role, you know, who better? But actually, when you look at sort of the other side of that, the analytics, the systems knowledge, the understanding of how a business works, then I'd argue that that doesn't need to be law enforcement. But I think there has to be a balance. And I think it's a blended solution that actually both together join a great partnership. OK, thank you very much indeed. Let me move on because I want to try and get some more questions in. Scott, let me come to you. Javan Simpson, uh, as actually says a question for Scott, although I'd have asked it to you anyway. How would you advise a business that is reluctant to accept the realities that despite being presented with data, that loss is taking place, there's the opportunity for future loss, and there are gaps in process and accountability. The point is, just before we came on air, Scott, you were saying that, believe it or not, some organisations are not geared up for this. Uh, Javan's picked on that question. Uh, what's, the, what's the route, although it sounds to me a bit of a no-brainer, what's the route to saying you are being completely mad here and you're being counterproductive for your own self-interest? 
Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of parts. I mentioned before about you know, the pride and ego part, let alone for the awareness, self-awareness with the business. And so you know, I suppose where I've had the most success with that is I use the same process for streamlining efficiency and helping revenue and expense control rather than the security and risk part if you've got people, uh, I suppose, that are blind to the realities of their own business. And then the fallout from doing thorough supply chain, individual node mapping and those vulnerabilities and crossover points for it as well then naturally flows onto like these other parts. Um, so, so that's how I've managed that part because I, I completely agree with you know, with what Giovanna said. There's there's some organisations that sadly have still got the 1980s guns, guards and gates approach uh, and haven't got an awareness of like of the current position with their business. And so we you know we sometimes we need to influence them towards that outcome by taking that by taking that approach. So so that's how I've advised them, I suppose, and influence towards the outcome. Um, it's the same principle about the fact that any improvements, refinements, risk mitigation strategies need to be underpinned, as I said, by that operational efficiency and other part. So I use that path to clearly map out and articulate where the deficiencies are and then, you know, like and, and tie it back together through, through, through that way. Yeah, OK, thank you. Paul, I've got a question for you from uh, Tracy Rogers. And Paul, um, Tracy makes the point that uh, in the NHS, which for those of you overseas is our National Health Service, uh, um, profit protection is really about fraud. Uh, obviously, this is a world you're very familiar with. Um, uh, and I guess uh, um, that is going to be increasingly common, isn't it? As since that's the most common crime in the UK. Do you think we're going to see a shift towards a greater focus on that area, Paul? And is that, is that inevitable or and a good thing? I, I think... Um... You know, the way my mind's at is, is fraud is already in um, the profit protection arena. And if somebody hasn't got it in profit protection, then they really are, you know, losing losing pace with what's going on. You know, uh, and, and fraud, internal fraud, internal theft is huge. Um, a lot of organisations are putting, you know, time, effort and resources into looking at that. And those that aren't, I would say, are, you know, likely to be losing vast amounts of um, product or cash. So, you know, fraud is just one strand and, and some of the most successful setups, if you like, that, that I personally like is where you might have um, a sort of risk director at the top and he or she will have somebody heading up, uh, you know, e-commerce, uh, distribution centers and stores, but they all need to talk to each other because a fraud that happens you know, in a distribution center might be because data is being skimmed in store or being harvested online. So having that risk director, he or she sitting over the top and having a, a, a greater view is really why I've seen some retailers then take big bounds forward. That risk director is then often either invited to board meetings or in some instances even uh, sit on the, the retail board. And, and, and that fraud thing has to be in the mix already. And if anybody's not got that in the mix as well, then I think they, you know, there's a there's a job to be done to to get that into the into the thread also. Yeah, it makes sense to me. And Sarah, just very quickly, Mike Gibbs, uh, I want to get two more questions if I can, and we're running out. Mike Gibbs has asked about um, uh, whether this is really a matter of risk management. Uh, um, and part of the problem is that. We, um, this world has not been seen as essential to doing business. And until it is, it's forever going to be on the run. Call it what you like, profit protection, loss prevention, risk management, but it's got to be seen as essential. It's not now. And the route out of this is to change that mindset. Sarah, just uh, if I can ask you a comment on that. Yeah. So, you know, profit protection for me is it's all end to end. So it's security, it's loss prevention. It's all of those things in that. And actually, although, you know, it's supporting the sales piece that goes with it, the, the mileage um, fraud that happens, you know, personal mileage, et cetera, there's lots of different elements of this that actually makes up the whole profit protection piece. So it's not just your, you know, your warehouse theft and fraud. It's everything that comes with this. And so I, you know, I always explain it as profit protection, loss prevention and security should be combined all together. And I think it depends where all of these things report through to. So, you know, a credit risk team should actually be part of a profit protection team. And quite often I see this split in businesses that you have a risk director looking at risk as in, you know, business risk, health and safety, et cetera. And profit protection is not included in that piece. And for me, it needs to be a full 360. 
And what would you just very kind of would you call what would you call you'd call it profit protection? That's your favorite. I term. Absolutely would, yes. Okay. Yeah. Let me very quickly then, Scott, come back to you. And a question we've got from David Gill, uh, um, which is uh, um, has online changed the approach uh, uh, in this area? Presumably uh, um, it's, it's creating a big shift, or is it, Scott? Yeah, I mean, for, for the online part, from online business and retailers, I, I think it's the same challenges. You know, I mentioned before about that whale watching. The difference is now the framework, you know, I suppose the difference is if there's physical stock taken from a store from you, you can see it. Data scraping are things that happens like over time. And to touch on what Paul said, a lot of the flow on issues that are occurring here, uh, you know, I like that Swiss cheese effect. It's data scraping, then other parts, then vulnerability and checking, uh, like and then and continuing um, forward. So I, I think it all needs to be part of the initial planning and discussion because you know what, what Sarah said is exactly right. There is siloing occurring uh, we, we, yeah, and that's where these gaps are. Same as when you map a supply, um, so a full supply chain, the vulnerable points of the change in ownership, accountability and other th and, and it's exactly the same with the gaps with siloing in organizations that they need to be closed. I, I saw some of the other comments in the chat. I think um, uh, Iona had like, mentioned about getting a full understanding for the business why it's so important and I could not agree more. I, I see that as being the biggest deficiency, you know, the full understanding of the business and its risks. And we're talking a lot now about what the current framework is. The next step is we haven't even touched on how do we get some of the organizations forward facing and think what's what's the 12 month plan, the 18 month plan, the 48 month like month plan, you know, when we're still blowing the dust off our continuity plans now that that's the next big challenge i i see getting this right and like and making the whole this approach but then being forward thinking because this is all going to change again when the risk landscape changes in the next 12 months yeah. okay and paul i was going to ask you just in one minute if i might paul because we're running out of time this same point how this this online business has this changed dramatically the nature of the i mean is there a different skill set to dealing with this as they would be up to being uh, um, more physical, if I could use that word, because that then itself creates another fracture, another dynamic. Paul? Um, there is a different skill set, but the, the, the fundamental requirement to look for risk and protect loss of profit is the same. You just need to bring somebody into the team that understands, you know, data analytics, data mining. But they need to have the same mindset as the people responsible for distribution centers. And, 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 you know, it all has to go in the mix. And very quickly, you know, the bad guys and girls out there, they are testing every single part of a retailer's business every single day. And so a retailer can't just switch the resources to online thinking they've sorted the store because, you know, the bad guys and girls will know that you've switched resources away. They will talk to each other and your stores will get hit. So again, Sarah touched on it, and Scott, this 360 approach, you have to have a strategy that understands your world, and the best you can, you have to put a protective mesh over all of it, and it's a constant evolution, whilst at the same time, maximizing the customer experience. Nobody said it was easy. If it was, we'd have cracked it decades ago. It's And the reason this business is so interesting and great is that it never stands still retail never stands still you know if you if you wanted an easy life go and become a civil servant or a or a or a, or a professor martin but <laughs> well indeed indeed well, look, thank you very much indeed everyone thank you very much indeed the the audience for all your questions i just see on that point william deal has pointed out that um he really enjoyed the handbook of security. And just to say, for those of you who are interested in the handbook of security, it's a book where all the leading experts in academia in the world come together and write a chapter on their expertise. The new one is out next year. So it's just been fun. The chapter from Adrian Beck as well. So something to look out for in that. So thank you very much. And thank you all of you. Thank you so much for your questions as well, audience. I'm so sorry we didn't get around to them all, but it's a sign of a, a good webinar when you leave more. And we are definitely going to be returning to this uh, in the future, I promise. Thank you very much indeed to Lodge Service for sponsoring it. Thank you very much indeed uh, to Sarah for inspiring the webinar. Um, let me just say a few other final points, if I might, very, very quickly, just to say the Cyber Outstanding Security Performance Awards, the Worldwide Cyber Oscars, they close on Monday. You've got till Monday to get your entries in. So please do uh, uh, make sure that you get them in by midnight on Monday. 
the Cyber Outstanding Security Fund. They're all the categories. Uh, in the UK, the Tackling Economic Crime Awards are now um, closed, but do look out for the uh, finalists and for the award ceremony that's taking place later in the year. The finalists will be announced in due course. And on the Ospers, Norway closes on the 16th, Germany on the 23rd. Uh, Australia, Romania and the UK are open. Get your entries in. Let's recognise those who are outstanding and what they do. Uh, let's move on just to say that we go through it all again next Thursday. Uh, when the topic next Thursday is thinking about security as a science, how developed is the body of knowledge? So very much looking forward to discussing that next Thursday with another elite panel. Uh, uh, once again, engaging experts from around the world. So thank you very much indeed, once again, to you, the audience. Thank you very much indeed to Hannah Miller in the background for helping to run the show, to my uh, esteemed panel for their insights, uh, to Lodge for sponsoring, and uh, uh, hopefully see you next Thursday. But until we meet again, wherever you were in the world, stay safe.